Hello, everybody, and welcome to One Sustainability. I am James Rosenstein, a member of the advisory board of One Business World. One Sustainability features entrepreneurs, founders, and business leaders who have sustainability as a core component of their overall strategy, presenting on cutting edge topics and the latest industry developments. Our goal is to educate and inform the global business and entrepreneurial communities on the importance of sustainability and to promote and su support sustainable business growth while protecting our planet. Today, we're very pleased to welcome leading sustainability expert and advisor, Alex Cohen. Alex is a senior sustainability analyst at Governance and Accountability, Accountability Institute, focusing on helping clients to advance their sustainability strategies. At the Governance and Accountability Institute, Alex and his team provides services and customized proprietary resources to assist clients in developing strategies, measuring, managing, communicating, and disclosure and reporting on ESG issues, and to help become well-recognized leaders in sustainability and ESG, achieving wider recognition in the capital markets and among other important societal stakeholders customers, clients, employees, regulators, business partners, and society at large. Alex, it is a great pleasure to have you here with us today and to hear more about navigating the sustainability journey. Thank you and welcome to One Sustainability. James, so yes, my name is Alex Cohen and I'll be discussing how companies can navigate the sustainability journey. Um, I'll give a quick introduction into who I am and to some of the experience that I bring, uh, discuss a bit about why sustainability is so important today to businesses, and then give an overview of the industry, discussing some of the, the key concepts, uh, the key players, best practices, and some of the most recent important developments before closing out with discussing some of the more common material topics that a business is likely to uh, have to tackle when beginning their sustainability journey. So for me, as James mentioned, I'm a senior sustainability analyst at the Governance and Accountability Institute. Um, our organization was established with the idea of proactively managing sustainability issues uh, as our founders had a lot of experience in crisis management dealing with problems after the fact, rather than trying to proactively manage and prevent issues. And our, uh, what, what we are most known for is our flagship uh, S&P 500 and Russell 1000 research, where we carefully monitor all of the sustainability practices and disclosure activities of uh, initially the S&P 500, uh, uh, but we have recently expanded to cover the entire Russell 1000. Um, and as you can see here, our key results that more than 90% of S&P 500 companies now are publishing sustainability reports, as well as 65% of Russell 1000 companies. So this is something that has become quite mainstream for many companies, and we are seeing more and more smaller companies now uh, uh, getting onto the bandwagon of uh, sustainability reporting and disclosure. And so let me start by explaining why this is so, and then we can dive a little bit into the industry. So there are three key reasons why companies are uh, moving into uh, uh, real sustainability activities. Uh, one of the most important is going to be uh, investor interest. So according to the uh, US Sustainable Investment Forum, in 2020, there were $17.1 trillion of uh, US assets under professional management that were being invested using sustainable investing strategies. This is approximately one third of the entire uh, market uh, for US assets under professional management. So this is now a huge pot of money that um, is only being invested in companies with, ES with sustainability strategies. And in particular, uh, some of the most important things that investors are looking for are uh, activities on climate change or executive pay. 
just as examples of where, where investor interest is being driven. Uh, but there's also important uh, customer demand. In addition to you know, retail customers looking for sustainability, uh, looking for more sustainable companies, uh, many, many large businesses are increasingly making commitments that involve their supply chain. So uh, large customers are, in, so large business customers are demanding that even private companies, if they're going to do business with a large, with a big business, must take on sustainability commitments simply in order to remain competitive uh, when bidding for large business. Um, a common example here would be companies setting science-based targets to reduce emissions. I'll discuss a little bit more later science-based targets. But the important thing to, to remember is that they tend to cover supply chain. So it's important for companies to engage with their supply chain, which includes many smaller businesses, to show leadership. And then, of course, employee retention. Uh, employees typically want to work at companies that are doing good things and that have you know, high ethical standards. Uh, according to a survey, actually just this week from Get Smarter, 56% of employees are more likely to stay with a company that has a sound sustainability agenda. So this is the opportunity. Um, better, you know, better investor returns, uh, happier customers, and uh, better employee retention. So with that, um, there is one big thing to understand about sustainability, that it does not equal climate change. When we talk about sustainability, we're really talking about something much, much broader. And in fact, the most common framework to think about sustainability is called ESG, or Environment, Social, and Governance. So uh, this is because a company, in order to be a sustainable company, can't just be making environmentally friendly products, but all, you know, addressing climate change, ensuring that they don't have, you know, they're not overtaking water, especially from water stressed areas, that they are protecting biodiversity. Uh, these are important environmental concerns, but social issues are also extremely important in, when dealing with sustainability issues. After all, if a company's leadership does not reflect their employee base or their customer base, uh, they, they do not have, this is not a sustainable business model. If a company is not respecting human rights concerns, this is not a sustainable business model. If companies, you know, do not, do not know what issues are lurking in their supply chain, this is not a sustainable business model. Uh, similarly, for governance, um, this is an issue that in many ways for US-based companies is not a strong concern given um, uh, legal requirements. But this topic tends to concern issues around um, oversight of the um, sustainability program ensuring that companies are um, actively making, uh, actively managing the commitments that they are making. And of course, uh, dealing with ethics and integrity issues, such as anti-corruption, anti-bribery, anti-trust. You know, all of these issues will, have, will cause a business model to be less sustainable. So with this framework in mind, let me talk a little bit about some of the key players in the sustainability field that any business will want to be familiar with when, um, when, when beginning their sustainability journey. And there's a few key groups that I want to mention. Uh, the most important here is the stakeholders uh, because for many businesses, they tend to view stockholders as the, the key group. But to truly be a sustainable company, there are many different or, uh, uh, stakeholders that have to be considered. So when, when, and when you, you know, decide on your key material topics, which I'll discuss a bit more later, and begin to disclose uh, your on your sustainability activities and build out a program, it's important to consider all of these key stakeholders. Uh, with, while keeping in mind that in many ways, investors are the most uh, important of the group uh, because they're the ones who are really driving a lot of this activity through, as I mentioned earlier, uh, now having one in three US investment dollars uh, in ESG funds. And, the, and in particular, one investor that I, I want to um, mention here that's really driving a lot of activity has been uh, BlackRock. 
And this is through uh, their annual letters. And I'll discuss the impact of uh, Larry, their CEO's annual letters in a little, a little bit later. But through um, you know, driving the adoption of best practices in the companies that they are invested in, it has done a great deal of, um, in the last couple of years to really advance sustainability reporting and sustainability uh, and management of sustainability issues. But that's not to neglect the other um, key stakeholders. You know, I'd, I'd mentioned the benefits of focusing on employees and customers, but you know it's also important to consider these other groups, uh, suppliers, uh, governments, and local communities. All of them need to be considered when a company is laying out their sustainability strategy and beginning to tackle these issues. Um, and then looking at some of the other key players in the industry, uh, one of the most important from an investor standpoint are the ESG data providers. And there are many of them, but some of the key ones listed here would be Bloomberg, ISS, MSCI, Refinitiv, and Sustainalytics. All of them uh, provide scores and profiles uh, but also have their own unique quirks, such as when they when they update data, what information they focus on, whether it's simply the level of disclosure or what that disclosure is, the, the quality of it. So there are, um, and these, these are the organizations that really guide a lot of corporate activity when it comes to uh, building out a sustainability program. Uh, and of course, I need to mention the credit rating agencies. Uh, because all three of them uh, now integrate ESG considerations into their credit ratings and will make credit decisions based on uh, ESG factors. These are not the sole factors, but they do have a, a role to play. Um, and all of them are making active moves in the sustainability space. So, for example, just last week, uh, Fitch launched uh, Sustainable Fitch to a program to rate um, ESG products with the goal of ultimately providing ratings, uh, ESG ratings for all fixed income instruments. Uh, this is building on their work in 2019, launching ESG relevant scores, um, which are now maintained for more than for 10,000 issuers and transactions. Uh, but there's, and then of course there's Moody's, which has acquired uh, Vigio Iris, one of the other major ESG data providers, and that also gives ESG scores. And finally, S&P um, has made one of the uh, bigger moves by uh, acquiring the corporate sustainability assessment, uh, which I'll discuss more in a, a little bit. But the important part to remember is that all is that they are all integrating sustainability data into their uh, credit rating models. So all of these uh, key players should be considered. Um, when, when embarking on the sustainability journey. So let me talk now a little bit about how companies actually get started. So this entails um, working through uh, uh, what's called a materiality assessment to really get started. And so this is because there are hundreds, thousands potentially of topics that uh, exist in the sustainability field. But there's only going to be really a half dozen or a dozen that uh, where the company can really have an impact and can really drive forward progress. So it's really important for a company to begin before doing anything else with understanding what their material topics are and what they need to focus on. Um, uh, you know what, what they're going to then build out their sustainability program on, and importantly, um, performing and creating an annual sustainability report to disclose on what they're doing and provide context and details for in, for all of the various stakeholders. And so, when when doing this, there's a few key frameworks to keep in mind. Uh, the most important, the big three would be the Global, the, uh, Global Reporting Initiative, or GRI, uh, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, or SASB, and the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, or TCFD. So let me discuss a little bit about these. Um, so the GRI is the oldest and the most widely used, actually founded in 1997. Uh, and this one is uh, European-based, and it's meant to be uh, uh, both universal and foundational. So um, 
the the sector the the GRI is universal in that it is the same set of standards used by every company in every industry, no matter their size. And so this allows for comparability between different organizations, although they are currently working on sector supplements that are under development. And the important thing to understand about GRI is that it's really the foundation of all of other reporting frameworks and everything that's done maps to GRI ultimately. Um, and then of course with SASB, uh, this one is much more sector specific. They have 89 industry specific frameworks and it's meant to be informed by what investors care about specifically and be evidence-based to ensure that what they are asking companies to disclose are relevant to investors. Uh, and this one was founded in uh, 2011, making it a bit more recent, but it's really taken off uh, since um, uh, BlackRock got behind it to encourage companies to report disclose using the framework. And then TCFD is um, in, an investor-backed framework that focuses in, on climate change and climate-related disclosure. And this one has also been recently embraced by BlackRock, as well as uh, for UK-based companies. Uh, they have, uh, the UK has adopted TCFD as mandatory reporting to focus on climate change disclosure. And then there's a few other frameworks that companies can consider using when disclosing, um, such as the IIRC or, integrated, or International Integrated Reporting Council or the uh, CDSB, or the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, although these are both more uh, niche. And then there are, for many industries, industry-specific organizations that will create standards that companies can use when thinking about what material topics they need to uh, focus on. A particularly well-known example would be uh, GRESBY, the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark used for um, uh, used, used in the commercial real estate sector and the, the SDGs, which are really more uh, meant for governments than corporations. Um, the, other, uh, the other key thing when companies are getting started in the sustainability journey is to um, uh, focus on annual surveys. Uh, there are a number of important ones, uh, including CDP, formerly the Carbon Disclosure Project, which focuses heavily on carbon disclosure, uh, although they have more recently added uh, forest and water disclosures as well. Um, but this, this organization is one of the largest and oldest with their sur annual survey covering thousands of companies, cities, uh, even states and regions now. Uh, and they are uh, closely aligned with the TCFD as both of them are heavily carbon focused. Uh, and then the, the CSA, or Corporate Sustainability Assessment. Uh, this is the organization that I'd mentioned that was fully acquired by s in 2019. Uh, this CSA is uh, an invitation-only uh, survey that was, though, expanded this year to include many more companies as the S&P build, builds out their program. Uh, but this, this, the CSA is quite important because it's used to construct the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, uh, the S&P 500 ESG Index, as well as uh, many other sustainability-focused indexes for investors. Uh, and then, of course, there are um, other surveys, the most important being supply chain surveys, uh, because uh, supply chain management is one of the most uh, important elements of uh, a strong ESG program, touching on many other aspects um, uh, of a program. So with that, let me, let me talk a little bit about some of the recent developments and ongoing activities in the sustainability field, because it is moving uh, quite quickly. So you can see all of these headlines are just in the last few months, um, where we have a few to particularly highlight around uh, mandatory disclosure and reporting. Uh, in the UK, they are moving toward mandating TCFD disclosure, heavily focusing on climate change. Um, but we also have here, uh, the SEC is currently moving aggressively uh, toward uh, mandating some sort of disclosure on climate risk. Uh, at this point, it's not clear if the SEC is going to adopt the TCFD like the UK did, 
or uh, an equivalent form of carbon uh, disclosure. But this is one of the, the big uh, changes that we're expecting in the next couple of months, uh, probably by the end of this year or early next year. Uh, but there's a couple of others, um, key developments that are worth highlighting here. Uh, for example, the Science-Based Targets Initiative um, uh, mandating a 1.5C uh, goal. So the Science-Based Targets Initiative is uh, an important organization that provides verifications that um, a company's carbon reduction targets are in line with the 1.5C of warming um, agreement in the, uh, uh, that was settled in the Paris Agreement. And companies can uh, submit their goals uh, to the um, SBTI for verification. And the important thing, as I'd mentioned earlier here, is that it requires a scope, uh, a, a target that focuses, that includes your third, their third party emissions or their suppliers, um, you know, uh, uh, their business partners to also be making uh, cuts. Uh, and then the other big um, ongoing uh, process in the sustainability field is around framework alignment. I just ran through on the last slide, uh, half a dozen frameworks. And this can lead to a real alphabet soup of what, what frameworks are important, which organizations are out there. And so five of the organizations announced last year that they were going to move toward an alignment. Uh, this would be uh, CDP, CDSB, GRI, IIRC, and SASB, which is a real alphabet soup, even for practitioners in the field. So what these organizations are doing is trying to, to merge and begin to unify their standards so they can be uh, a, bit, a bit more uh, user-friendly and it'll, be, it'll simplify the entire field. Uh, as of um, in the last year, the, the big progress there is that the SASB and IIRC organizations have merged to create the Values Reporting Foundation. So we are seeing some movement as these organizations are trying to come together. So uh, this is, but this is all happening, um, you know, quite quickly, and we are seeing, you know, almost daily evolution and change related to these topics. So let me now uh, dive in, maybe to a little bit more detail, to talk about some of the the most common material topics that uh, companies will face and just provide a little bit of an overview into what these topics entail and how companies can begin to think about managing them. So starting with uh, environmental topics, uh, there's a few key ones that I think are worth highlighting. Uh, the most important, of course, is climate change. And to, be and to begin with, what any company needs to do uh, is to conduct and uh, perform a uh, greenhouse gas or GHG inventory. Uh, this allows companies to establish baselines for their emissions um, because after all, you, you can't um, manage what you, you can't measure. So this allows companies to understand what their emissions are like, and in particular to break down their scope one, two, and three emissions. Uh, these are emissions that are in the world of greenhouse gas accounting, these are the emissions that are either produced by the company directly, scope one, uh, produced directly in support of the company's activities, scope two. This typically refers to the electri purchased electricity or scope three emissions referring to all third party emissions. This would be your suppliers, your customers, end of life, employee commuting. Uh, all of these are all of these are the other emissions that occur as a result of your company's admissions uh, activities, but are not directly from your company. Um, and there are numerous ways to deal with these problem uh, with these emissions. In particular, uh, for uh, scope one or scope three emissions, there are carbon offsets uh, where companies can try to actually reduce, uh, can try to offset some of their emissions by investing in other projects. Uh, for scope two emissions, there are RECs or renewable energy credits. These are things that companies can purchase to offset their, their uh, dirty electricity generation. Um, and of course, setting a science-based target. Uh, this will allow companies to um, begin to uh, uh, 
uh, by setting a science-based targets, companies can begin to uh, act act actively reduce their emissions and show progress on meeting the Paris Agreement. Uh, then in terms of an environmental management system, this is one of the most important aspects for any sustainability topic, is showing that a company has ownership over the topic and has and is managed manage, actively managing the topic. So this would involve, for example, setting out a, an environmental policy, something with clear objectives like preventing spills or meeting legal requirements, uh, having oversight with clear roles and responsibilities, you know, operational controls, employee training, all the elements of a well-functioning management system to show that a company takes this issue seriously. And then uh, the last one I want to highlight is biodiversity, um, which, in my opinion, is the, going to be the next big thing in environmental issues. Um, similar to climate change, uh, the UN has, has already organized a series of regular conferences to address the issue of biodiversity. And I realize a series of UN conferences may not sound like the, the, the most appropriate solution. But it is this sort of slow consensus building strategy that ultimately got us to the Paris Agreement on climate change. And the hope is that we will ultimately be able to move forward in a similar way to tackle biodiversity. So I expect this topic to become much more central when dealing with environmental issues over the next couple of years. And then turning to uh, social issues, uh, one of the big ones, of course, uh, is um, you know, diversity and inclusion. And there, are a f and there are a few things that companies can do here, but the most important things to understand is that you know, we're, we're, when talking about diversity and inclusion, uh, there, are, there are many ways to think about this. And it, of course, covers um, uh, gender and, in the US, ethnicity. Uh, but age diversity is another key topic to uh, consider when discussing diversity and inclusion. Um, this is also a topic that includes equal pay. So ensuring that a company is diverse in all aspects of its, of its business, uh, be it um, a, a, a gender, a, a, a gender identity, age, ethnicity, um, there, are, there are many important ways that companies need to be managing uh, their diversity practices and ensuring that they are trying to uh, have as diverse a workforce as possible. Um, looking at employment, uh, this covers uh, uh, topics like training. So ensuring that uh, not only do companies have training programs uh, to upgrade the skills of their workforce, uh, but providing support for continuing education. So, so their workforce can continue to upgrade their skills and become more valuable. Uh, providing benefits, uh, an important benefit, you know, uh, uh, traditionally has always been parental leave, but uh, increasingly uh, in, in 2021, um, a, a hybrid work model or a complete work from home model is uh, also an important benefit that companies need to consider to have a, a sustainable uh, business model. Um, and then there are others that get a little bit more uh, specialized. So if you know labor management relations in the event that a company has a union, um, depending on the industry, worrying about um, you know child labor or forced labor, um, so there are numerous employment practices that companies should be, you know, on the lookout for, ensuring that there are good policies around um, to make sure, certain that these issues are being managed. Uh, when it comes to health and safety, uh, you know, ensuring that the health, the um, EHS management system um, is tracking both employees and contractors. That it includes all the all the proper el elements for a strong. Um, health and safety system that's ensuring company, uh, you know, um, uh, trying to minimize, um, you know, in injuries. Uh, looking at human rights, you know, it's the, the, the foundation of a strong human rights policy, which touches on many others, is to have a policy that is aligned with the eight core international labor organization conventions. So these include bans on you know, child and forced labor, on ensuring decent working conditions, and uh, as well, the UN's uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the two international covenants. Uh, these are commonly referred to as the International Bill of Rights, uh, Bill of Human Rights, sorry. And these are, uh, so this, this is the most important foundation when it comes to addressing human rights is ensuring the right policy 
and from there ensuring that your operations and importantly as we'll discuss in the next bullet that your supply chain is respecting human rights which leads to the supply chain management another very key issue touching on um, pretty much every other topic is to ensure that a company has a strong supply chain management policy addressing similarly uh, those issues that are addressed in a human rights policy and best practice is really to do third party assessments of your of your key suppliers. So there are and there are numerous organizations that will do that can do this so you can actually plug into a larger network um, uh, when trying to do supply chain assessments. It does not have to be you know the, the company trying to ask their suppliers um, and see how that goes. Uh, and then finally, uh, data security. Similarly, uh, with the growing focus, this is also, um, I think, the next big thing in social issues is trying to um, is trying to demonstrate strong data security and customer privacy practices. And then, you know, the from there, I think the next, you know, uh, real areas. So for governance is going to be, as I mentioned at the beginning, ESG oversight. And what this really refers to is having, um, uh, you know, over, like I said, oversight of the program. So showing, you know, who is in charge. Is it, uh, you know, is there a board committee with oversight over ESG issues? Um, but do they receive regular reports? Uh, are there are there specific targets for the for the program? And very importantly. Is there any kind of an executive pay link to um, uh, sustainability objectives? So, you know, if if you know increasing diversity or hitting climate uh, reduction targets, you know, if these are linked to executive pay, this is really the gold standard to show oversight and ownership of sustainability issues. Uh, and of course, ethics. You know, some of the big ones are you know anti-corruption, anti-bribery, antitrust. The most important thing that a company can do here would be to show that they have strong whistleblower protections, that they have a, a, an internal reporting mechanism. There, that better? We can hear you. Alex. Excellent. Anyway, um, you know, showing that a company has strong whistleblower protections, um, that they have a, uh, a process in place to manage, um, you know, uh, complaints that companies have, uh, employees have, that they are, you know, taking these issues seriously and investigating when a uh, complaint is raised, showing that, you know, they, they have ownership over ethics and integrity issues. So these are, you know, some of the key issues that a company is likely to face. You know, what, what you uh, as a specific company face in your industry will not line up exactly with these key topics. But, you know, if, if you are showing ownership um, and management and leadership on these topics, if you are showing that you have strong policies, that you have um, active programs in place, uh, you can, uh, that you are disclosing in a sustainability report that is using the best practice frameworks, uh, you can really take advantage of all of the opportunities that are presented by having a strong sustainability program. So thank you. So this is terrific, uh, really touching on the big things. Just a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, as we know, there still is a certain level of resistance to adopting ESG measures. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think are the issues that most drive resistance to taking action? And what kind of companies, which kinds of companies are most involved in this, this kind of unwillingness to take it seriously and move ahead? I think in many cases, uh, it's, it's a question of uh, inertia. For a lot of companies, they haven't had to deal with this. And there are, there is, uh, in some places, an attitude that un unless it is legally mandated, um, they're not going to do it. And th so, you know, a, a, a real issue with sustainability, the sustainability field right now is, as I mentioned, there are multiple frameworks. This is voluntary, and so it can be a bit of a challenge 
to demonstrate that um, there, there are real benefits and um, to, to lay out the case that um, uh, there are, there's a reason that companies are doing this and that they can, they, they can benefit from being a little bit more open. Although in my experience, it does take a bit of handholding and you know, patience to walk people through this resistance. Uh, but in terms of, um, you know, in, I, I would not be, actually say that there are any specific industries that I think are more, more resistant than others. Um, I find that in every industry, there are leaders and laggards. And so it's, it's really more a question of individual company leadership than being able to point to a sector and say that, you know, they're a leader or they're a laggard. Right. I mean, there have been a lot of discussions about trying to balance purpose and profit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that there's often a lot of board pressure not to release any kind of issue that is important to profit. Mm. Yes. And what I'm what I think is important for companies to understand is that there is no contradiction here. Um, if if companies want to be sustainable in the long term, which means being profitable in the long term, they need to embrace sustainable practices or they will not or, or they will um, eventually fail, which is not very profitable. So, you know, it, 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 companies are going to be a lot less profitable in a world with catastrophic climate change. Um, you know, companies that do not have diverse workforces are less profitable. So, you know, there, it's not a question of, you know, do we want purpose? Do we want profit? It's a question of how do we align these two things? So we're not looking at, you know, purpose as a sideshow. Or, or um, you know, we, we need to look at how, how we can integrate this in, right into the business strategy. Right. Yeah, I understand. Um, another question. Um, the, some of the big NGOs, Greenpeace, Nature Conservancy, are talking a lot about this. Do they have an influence on actually bringing corporations to more responsible behavior? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, what, what a lot of what these organizations can can do is, you know, operate at a larger scale. So when, you know, a, a, when a company really wants to start to have an impact, um, it can be it can be difficult to, to identify, um, you know, the the large, you know, where they can actually have a large scale result. And it's these organizations that are operating um, at scale that can actually absorb you know, a, a huge amounts of funds that um, provide companies with the opportunity to to actually have you know strong environmental results, and so you know these will they are they are certainly part of the conversation. Um, you know, I, I, frankly, you know, it, it, it's largely like I said, this is largely investor driven, um, and I say that they are the primary drivers. Although you know, every stakeholder is involved. Sure. Okay, well, those were, you know, we could continue this discussion for a long time. It's such an interesting and important topic, but uh, I want to thank you, Alex, very much once again for your time. This is very helpful. And um, this is an important part of the One Sustainability series. Uh, and I think this is, this is moving in the direction of really helping a lot. So thank you very much. And we look forward to talking again with you soon. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It was great.